If you moved into a creepy old house that turned out to be possessed by a demonic spirit, what would you do? The rooms are empty, but there's something living in the shadows, and it wants your whole family dead. I'm here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the haunting demon in <laughs> The Conjuring. <laughs> This family is about to have the scariest night of their lives. It's a fall afternoon in Harrisville, Rhode Island, and Roger and Carolyn pull into their driveway with a car full of kids. Everyone's excited because it's move-in day at their new countryside house. Well, almost everyone, except for their oldest daughter, Andrea, and especially not their lovable family pooch, Sadie. It's a bit of a fixer-upper. The place is run down, isolated, and their dog won't even step through the front door. While the rest of the family unpacks their things, their youngest daughter, April, goes to check out the pond, where she finds an old music box under a big, creepy tree. Later that night, the girls play hide and clap, and Christine wanders around the house, blindfolded, looking for her sisters. She finds Nancy hiding in the closet, but that's when the girls knock a board off from the wall, revealing a hidden set of stairs that leads down to the cellar. Their dad pulls the rest of the boards away before lighting a match and descending into the cobweb-filled darkness. Just as the rest of them start to get worried, he climbs back through and says the place is only full of old junk, but warns the girls to stay out of the basement until he gets it cleaned up. The family heads to bed for the night, but their dog is barking like crazy and still refusing to come inside. Okay, this family might think that they're in for a normal night, but if you can't tell what's about to happen, then you haven't been paying attention. Our four-legged friend Sadie here already knows what's up, but the so-called superior species can't seem to take the hint. Whether or not dogs can actually sense spirits can't be proven by science, but what we do know is that our canine companions are naturally gifted with senses that are much more powerful than a human's and could help them pick up on things that we wouldn't immediately notice. A dog's strongest tool is their nose. Depending on the breed, their sense of smell can be up to 10,000 times more powerful than ours. And this means that they can smell all kinds of things that we can't. More than just super sniffers, dogs also have keen hearing, which allows them to detect sounds at higher frequencies than we can normally pick up as well as eyes that are tuned for better sight in low light conditions. Sadie here looks like an English shepherd dog, a breed that's known for their high intelligence and courage. As herding dogs, they take protecting their family very seriously, which explains her barking at them through the bedroom window. She was trying her hardest to get them out of the house. Besides keeping us company, they were born to protect farm animals from dangerous predators like wolves and coyotes. So if something's got them scared, it's in your best interest to pay attention. Sadie's reaction to the house should have been an immediate red flag. Now if you're wondering where a spirit could be lurking, look no further than that creepy ass basement. A cellar full of old junk is nothing to call the priest about, but when that cellar was boarded up and mysteriously missing from the property listing, there's only two possible explanations, and neither of them are good. Either that last owner was trying to keep people out, or they were trying to keep something in. After finding that, I'd want to search for any property records I could dig up to see what else this place might be hiding. They haven't experienced any paranormal activity yet, but something tells me that the real nightmare is just about to begin. The next morning, Carolyn wakes up with a mysterious bruise on her leg. The house is freezing cold, and at night the girls noticed a rancid smell in their bedrooms. Even the clocks have stopped working, all of them stopping at exactly 3.07 a.m. Things are already bad, but that's when they hear April's terrified scream from outside and find their poor dog lying dead in the yard. That night, while the family is asleep, an unforeseen force tries to pull Christine out of bed. Roger wakes up at his desk and hears a strange thumping from somewhere in the house. When the door at the end of the hallway swings open on its own, he thinks that it's just a breeze from an open window. But after a moment, the thumping starts again, this time coming from upstairs, where he finds Cindy sleepwalking and banging her head against the closet door. In the morning, Carolyn notices another huge bruise on her back and promises Roger that she'll go see a doctor. As he's heading out for work, he's scared by a bird that dies from crashing into the side of the house. April starts talking to her new imaginary friend, Rory, and tells her mom that he comes from the mirror in the music box that she found. 
She's bored while her sisters are away at school, so Carolyn puts on a blindfold and they play a game of hide and clap. When she gets to the oldest girl's bedroom, the closet doors swing open behind her and a pair of hands clap from the shadows behind the hanging clothes, drawing her closer. She checks inside, but gets creeped out when she sees that nobody is there. And as April walks in from the hallway, she realizes that her daughter was never in the room at all. At night, things get even worse. The demonic spirit almost pulls Christine to the floor, and she realizes that it's not just her imagination. Something is seriously wrong. Terrified, she peeks under her bed and watches as the door slowly moves on its own. She cries for her sister, pointing into the darkness and whispering that she can see somebody standing in the corner of their room. Nancy gets up to check, and that's when the bedroom door slams shut, frightening both girls and causing them to scream for their parents, with Christine saying that the demon wants to kill them all. Okay, this spirit doesn't waste any time. So what should the family do? The best place to start is always with the most logical explanations. Carolyn's mysterious bruise could be chalked up to something as simple as her banging her leg during the move and not noticing it until the morning. Intense exercise like carrying furniture in and out of the house can often lead to bruising around the affected muscles. The uncomfortable cold could most likely be a problem with the furnace, and the rancid smell the result of mildew, mold, or a dead animal decaying somewhere out of sight. Before we jump into a full-blown exorcism, I'd suggest calling a repairman, a mold specialist, and an exterminator just to see what they could find. As for April's imaginary friend, Cindy's sleepwalking, and Carolyn and Christine's hallucinations, these can all be explained by a lack of sleep brought on by a general sense of anxiety after their big move. Since these four are experiencing the worst symptoms, the best thing to do is for Carolyn to take the three girls to their family doctor right away for a medical professional's opinion. With our logical bases covered, we can move on to more sinister explanations, starting with what happened to poor Sadie. If we believe that the spirit killed her, then it would have done so to get closer to April, getting rid of her protector and replacing the dog as her new best friend. All of this started when she found the music box, so I'd take that thing away and tell her straight up that her friend Rory is actually an evil spirit who wants to hurt the family. As a young kid, she won't be in denial that this could even be possible like an adult would be. So it's best to just confront the problem head on. The wardrobe and the music box seem to be the most direct conduits for the spirit, so we're going to need to do something about them if we want the house ghost free. My gut instinct is to take any of the old antiques that were in the house out to the backyard and have a big bonfire but experts say that destroying the haunted object might just cause the spirit to jump out and latch onto something else, or someone else, so it's probably better to take a different approach. The safest bet would be to spiritually cleanse the entire house, but that process can be a bit complicated. For starters, if you want to get a priest involved, then you'll need a direct approval from the church, and by the time you get that, it could already be too late. So, if you're looking to take matters into your own hands, you can purchase bundles of cleansing herbs from a spiritual shop, using the smoke to cleanse the house room by room. For added protection, sprinkling salt along your doorways and windowsills is said to create a barrier for evil spirits. Other than destroying the cursed object or trying to cleanse the home, the only remaining option is to try and transfer the items to somebody else. It's a sketchy move, but you could have a big garage sale or take the items over to a donation center, and once the cursed goods are off your hands, then it's really not your problem anymore. With the demonic encounters ramping up, it's only a matter of time until someone starts crawling on the ceiling and vomiting blood, and the family needs to take some action while they still can. The next night, Carolyn is folding laundry when she hears a child giggle and clap from somewhere in the house. She goes to investigate, finding all the girls asleep in their beds, but just as she starts to think that it might have been her imagination, every picture frame hanging in the hallway behind her drops and shatters to the floor. Downstairs, the clock strikes 3 a.m. and someone claps again, leading Carolyn into the kitchen where she sees the basement door swing open. Needing to make sure that her kids are safe, she goes to check it out, and that was her worst mistake. She flips on the light and peeks around before wisely deciding to turn back, but it's too late. The door slams shut in her face, sending her rolling down the stairs into the darkness. As she looks around the basement, a ball bounces out from the shadows, and Carolyn runs up the stairs as the only source of light explodes. She makes it to the top, 
striking a match to get a look around, but a pair of ghostly hands claps directly behind her, and she screams as the match goes out. Meanwhile, Andrea wakes up to a thumping sound in her bedroom and sees Cindy there, banging her head against the closet door once again. She tucks her younger sister in, but the thumping continues, and this time the closet is moving on its own. Pulling the doors open, it looks like nobody's there, until suddenly a demonic old lady screams at them from above it, leaping down onto Andrea and tackling her to the floor. Hearing the chaos, Roger comes running into the house, helping the mom out of the basement before they both run upstairs to check on the girls. The demon may be gone for now, but the Knights of Torture are only just getting started. Okay, based on everything that's happened so far, we can narrow down our options for exactly what kind of entity is haunting the house and what they should do next. Not all spirits are the same, and there are actually many different types of hauntings that each have their own symptoms. First are residual energies, which linger around a specific location after certain traumatic events, but are not conscious and never interact with their observers. Intelligent entities can answer questions and interact with objects, but they're not always hostile. If you run into one of these varieties, there's not much to fear, but this family is dealing with something very different. When furniture starts flying around the room and people are getting screwed scratched in their sleep, there's a sure indication that you're dealing with a poltergeist. This type of haunting almost always centers around a girl who is going through puberty, called the human agent. Spiritualists believe that the changes going on in the girl's body combined with any trauma related to psychological or physical experiences, such as moving to a new house, can explode in the form of psychokinetic or PK activity. The family meets all of the requirements, but many experts disagree on whether poltergeists exist as individual spirits at all, and it could be that they're up against something even worse, a demonic haunting. Demonic or inhuman hauntings are very similar to poltergeists, except for in a few key ways. As the name suggests, these type of spirits never existed in a human form, and often want to possess their victims. Religious items in the house will be destroyed or go missing, and with rancid smells accompanying the activity, usually the demonic spirit focuses its attention mostly on one person, with them serving as the target for its possession. Demonic hauntings are extremely dangerous and should only be dealt with by professionals. Since the family has been experiencing all of the telltale signs, I'd say that it's time to contact a demonologist which is exactly what they're going to do next. Desperate to take back their home, Carolyn goes to a local university where professional paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren are holding a seminar. She explains her situation, begging the couple for help, and they hesitantly agree to come and check things out. At the house, she shows the Warrens that the whole family is sleeping downstairs and says that the place is always freezing, even though there's nothing wrong with the furnace. With the strange smells and constant thumping, late at night, Ed starts to think that there could be a true demonic presence lingering in the home. They take a look at the haunted closet before moving downstairs to the cellar, where Lorraine is overwhelmed by a powerful feeling of dark energy. In the kitchen, Ed sets up his tape recorder for an interview with Roger, explaining that the only reason they haven't moved out is because money is tight and they have nowhere else to go. Meanwhile, Lorraine sits down for a one-on-one -on -one talk with April, asking her about her new imaginary friend. The the girl says that her friend is always sad because something terrible happened to him and hands her the music box to have a look for herself. She winds up the key, and sure enough, a ghostly young boy appears in the doorway behind her, only visible in the reflection of the music box mirror. Lorraine walks out to the backyard, followed by her husband, but when she turns around, she sees a woman's body hanging from the tree right behind them, and after catching her breath, they head back inside to give their advice to the parents. They explain that a dark entity has attached itself onto every member of the family, and will follow them wherever they go. The only solution is to perform an exorcism, but it won't be easy. A true exorcism can only be effectively done by a trained expert, and to get the church's approval, they'll need to gather proof to make their case. On their way out, they warn the family that their visit to the house will most likely make the demonic spirit angry and cause the attacks to become worse, saying that they'll check in soon once they've prepared their equipment and done some research on the property. The Warrens return to their house for the night, and their daughter, Judy, gives her mom a locket with her picture to wear while she's away on the job. After tucking her in, 
in, Ed brings Lorraine the tape recorder, showing her that it never picked up anything that Carolyn had said back at the house. It's a bad sign, but the evidence that they find next is really the stuff of nightmares. Way back in 1863, a woman named Bathsheba sacrificed her seven-day-old baby in front of the fireplace before running out to the yard, devoting her soul to Satan, cursing anyone who tried to take her land. Her time of death? 3.07 a.m. Many years later, a new family moved into the home, but it wasn't long before their boy Rory went missing in the woods. The original property was split up and sold to a number of owners. But no matter who tried to live there, eventually, disaster always struck. Just then, the tape recorder turns on by itself, but instead of Carolyn's voice, all that they hear is the ghostly wailing of a thousand lost souls. The clock in their office stops. It's 3.07 a.m. Okay, this is why it's important to look up the property history before you buy a house. You just never know when that fixer-upper you're moving into was the site of a ritualistic human sacrifice. The Warrens seem dead set on collecting evidence to push for an exorcism, but while they're waiting, there's another option that might be worth looking into. The source of the demonic energy must be the evil spirit of the witch Bathsheba, who gained her power after sacrificing her infant child to the devil. Knowing this, I'd want to find out where the child was buried, and ask a priest to bless the gravesite and say a prayer for the child's soul. It's a long shot, but perhaps by giving the child's spirit a holy blessing, we could counteract the ritual and remove the source of Bathsheba's strength. This might only weaken her, and it might have no effect at all, but anything that we could do to give ourselves an advantage here is definitely worth a try. Also, I think it's time to call a landscaping company and get rid of that tree. Demonic attacks aside, nobody wants to be reminded of a witch sacrificing herself to Satan every time you go out back to grill some hot dogs. Who knows? Maybe destroying it will even cut off some of her power. There's only one way to find out. Now that they know what they're up against, hopefully Ed and Lorraine can help the family before it's too late. The next day, the Warrens arrive back at the house with a van full of ghost hunting gear, joined by their assistant Drew and Officer Brad Hamilton from the local police department. Roger asks about the cameras, and Ed explains that they're all connected to individual thermostats, set to take a picture if they detect an abnormal drop in temperature. Night falls, and the Warrens activate their equipment, ready to get their proof as soon as the dark energy appears. Ed unrolls a blanket full of his demon-slaying tools, setting small wooden crucifixes around the house to deliberately make the spirit angry. Within minutes, the basement door swings open, and they grab their portable camera and audio gear before plunging down into the depths, keeping the lights off to multiply the spooky factor. Down in the cellar, Ed challenges the demon to communicate with them, checking the area for any signs of spectral activity. To him, it seems like nothing's there, but Lorraine doubles over in pain, as if she can feel a presence that nobody else can. Frustrated, they head upstairs to check the cameras, and that's when the basement door slams shut right behind them, convincing everyone that the dark spirit is real. In the morning, the Warrens agree to look after the house while Roger and the kids go into town for some ice cream, and Carolyn takes a nap to get some rest. Lorraine stands out in the yard, hanging laundry on the line, when suddenly a huge gust of wind blows down a sheet that wraps around an invisible figure standing just before her. It flies up to the bedroom window, and a ghost stares down at the woman before turning and walking out of sight. Inside, several bruises start to appear around Carolyn's arm, and she wakes up screaming as a demented old lady floats over her and vomits blood into her mouth. Lorraine runs to check on her, finding her locked in the upstairs bathroom. Although the woman claims to be fine, she can tell that something's not quite right, but before they have a chance to talk, Carolyn hears Roger and the girls pull up outside and goes to see them instead. Okay, talk about waking up on the wrong side of the bed. Knowing that we've got a demonic spirit shacking up in the basement, I would have taken some steps to protect myself before I laid down for a little afternoon nap. First of all, don't split up. This should be obvious, but it's always good to have someone watching your back, especially when demonic possession is on the table. Carolyn has two of the world's most experienced paranormal investigators right there in her home. Why not have Lorraine sit with her while she takes a nap instead of sending her out to the yard to catch up on the laundry? This would help with the investigation too, since she could be there to witness and record anything strange that happened. Sitting around and hoping that the spirit doesn't come back is exactly how you end 
up drinking its blood vomit. That doesn't work for me, so I'm going to borrow some moves from the real professionals. Nowadays, most people believe that witches only exist in fantasy books and horror movies. But for some European and American cultures in the 17th and 18th centuries, harmful magic was a very real fear, and they created their own ways to fight back. To ward off evil magic, early New Englanders would carve patterns called witch marks into the wood near their doors, windows, and fireplaces. These could take the shape of several conjoined circles or crisscrossing lines designed to confuse and trap the spirits that tried to enter the home. If you felt like doing some arts and crafts, then you could create a witch bottle or witch ball. I won't tell you what they used to put in those bottles, but for our purposes, a bit of holy water and some salt would do the trick. For a witch ball, all you need is a hollow sphere made of glass. The bottles were hidden somewhere on the property or in the house, while the balls were hung near the windows or in the center of the room. In both cases, the idea was that the evil spirit would be attracted to the object and become trapped. Knowing this, I would pick a room in the house and use these techniques to create a safe zone, carving witch marks near any entrances and leaving one of my shoes by the door. In place of a proper witch ball, I'd just try hanging beer or milk bottles in the windows and seeing if that does the trick. It might not work at all, but you won't know until you try, and taking any steps to fight back is better than doing nothing here. It looks like it's too late for Carolyn, and we'll have to see if the rest of the family can make better decisions when the spirit returns. Roger thanks Ed for helping their family out, but he admits that he didn't want to come at first because he's seen how the work affects his wife. Several months ago while working on an exorcism, she saw something that seriously messed her up, causing her to lock herself in her room and refuse to speak to anyone for eight days. He never asked her what he saw, but since that day, she hasn't been the same. The adults prepare themselves for another night of horrors as thick fog surrounds the house. It's late, and Officer Brad gets sleepy, so he goes to the kitchen for a cup of coffee where he thinks he hears something in the backyard. Stepping out onto the porch, it looks like no one's there, but as he passes by the laundry room, he sees the ghost of a young woman in a maid's uniform disappear behind a hanging sheet. He goes to investigate, but the woman is gone, and just when he thinks that the coast is clear, the spirit lunges at him from the darkness, screaming in his face and knocking him off of his feet. The rest of the team runs to see what happened, but before he can even fully explain, Cindy sleepwalks by at the end of the hall and heads up the stairs, triggering the cameras as she goes. But they watch as the girl walks into the bedroom and the door slams behind her, locking itself shut so powerfully that not even the three men can break it down. Listening in with their their audio equipment, Lorraine hears a spirit luring the girl into the closet, and when the men finally get through the door, she's nowhere in sight. Ed grabs a UV light and follows the girl's footsteps to the closet, pulling the clothes to the side and revealing handprints on the back panel, a secret door. He spots the kid inside, and they take her downstairs while Lorraine has a look around. April tells her that the closet is where her friend Rory hides when he's afraid, so she decides to check it out, crawling through the hole into the dark space between the walls. Inside, she makes a horrific discovery. Tucked below a shelf with a spot for April's music box is a long rope tied to a noose dangling through the boards. Suddenly, the floor gives out and she plummets all the way down to a hidden room in the basement. As Lorraine gathers herself, she hears a woman crying in the darkness and decides to use the mirror from the music box to see if she can make something appear. That's when she sees the image of a woman holding a bloody kitchen knife over Rory's dead body, and the spirit slowly turns towards her, revealing its disturbing hollow face. She peeks over her shoulder, but the spirit is gone, only to appear right behind her and repeat the words, she made me do it. The woman disappears, and Lorraine is about to leave when and suddenly a pair of dangling legs swings down from the ceiling right in front of her, spinning around and floating after her as she panics and runs for her life. Just when it looks like she's going to make it, the spirit drags her back by her locket, tearing it from her neck before she runs up the stairs to Ed and the rest of the crew. With the family looking on, Lorraine says that the spirit wants to possess the mother and use her to kill the children. The house starts to rumble as the crucifixes are thrown to the floor and Nancy is picked up by her her hair and flung across the room. The men try to catch her as the demon drags her back and forth along the ground, 
only stopping when Lorraine grabs a pair of scissors and cuts off the girl's hair. At sunrise, the Warrens load up their van, and Ed promises that they have the evidence they'll need to get approval for an official exorcism. But when he comes back, he won't be bringing his wife since he's afraid of what might happen to her. While preparing to leave, Lorraine hears her daughter's voice calling from the water and rushes out to the dock where she sees a vision of the girl floating just below the surface. Running inside to call her mom, she's relieved when she hears that Judy is all right, but they decide that it's in their best interests not to spend another minute in the possessed house. The Warrens head home for now, while the family and Drew get ready to spend the night at the local motel. Okay, they've got their evidence, but before the Warrens packed up and headed home, they should have done some more investigating into those new areas behind the bedroom wall and down in the basement. The spirit got the jump on Lorraine while she was all alone, but if they went in with backup, then there's a good chance they might have found even more helpful evidence in those unexplored spaces. Since they needed to get their evidence to the priest quickly, Lorraine should have taken Carolyn, the girls, and Officer Brad with her to the church. This way, the priest could have met with the mother and her family personally and given them his blessing and advice on what to do if the spirit came after them again. They could even stop at a store on the way and pick up a few crucifix necklaces, having the priest bless them for some added protection. Since we we know that the demon wants to possess the mother and kill the children, it's important that they're never left alone from now on, and Carolyn should volunteer to be handcuffed if things start to get bad. Meanwhile, Ed and Roger could dive deeper into the basement, searching for any clues and keeping Drew around to use as a meat shield if Bathsheba returns. They may think that they're making progress, but they're about to find out the hard way that the demon isn't done with them just yet. Before going back to their place, the Warrens visit a local priest to show him their footage of the demonic attack and photos of the ghost boy following Cindy up the stairs. He's shocked by what he sees, but points out that the family aren't members of the church, which could make it difficult to get the Vatican's blessing to perform a legitimate exorcism. They tell him that the family doesn't have much time left before something truly terrible happens, and he finally agrees to push the request through himself, saying that he'll call them once they have their approval. Late that night, back at the Warrens' house, Judy lies sleeping in her bed when her locket starts to swing on its chain, while miles away in the haunted basement, her mother's stolen locket does the same. Suddenly, the demonic force yanks her by her feet, and she goes out to the hallway to look for her parents. At the bottom of the steps, the door to the family's demonic evidence room waits open, and one particular item, the cursed Annabelle doll, is missing from its case. The girl tries to run back upstairs, but an unholy darkness engulfs the entire house, and she retreats into her parents' office, slamming the door behind her. The dark force pounds on the door over and over again, finally stopping as the lights in the room fade and go out. Turning around, the girl witnesses a horrifying sight. A disheveled woman sits in the rocking chair brushing Annabelle's hair and the doll slowly turns its head, staring directly at her. She tries to run, but the door is locked, her parents rushing in just in time to pull her out of the way, as the rocking chair hurtles towards them and explodes against the wall. Leaving Judy with his wife, Ed goes to check out the evidence room and finds the doll back in its case with the locks securely shut. Meanwhile, back at the hotel, the men return from the store only to find that Carolyn took two of the girls and drove off in their car without saying a word. Realizing that they're in serious danger, Roger calls Ed and tells him what's going on before hopping in the van with Drew and speeding off towards the house. Ed tries to convince his wife to stay behind, but she insists that they finish this together and they run out to meet the others. Okay, these parents are making some serious mistakes here. Let's start with the Warrens. As paranormal investigators, did you really think that it was safe to leave your daughter alone with her grandma in a house full of demonically possessed objects? One investigation goes too far, and the next thing you know, you've got demon dolls trying to hit you with a chair like John Cena. Next time, it might be safer to have your daughter stay somewhere else, like with another family member or at grandma's house if she doesn't always live with you. Also, if you're going to have a child with your lifestyle, then you need to at least give that kid some kind of paranormal training. That way she'll know what to do when she ends up in a battle with an evil spirit. Having all of those possessed items nearby and just telling her to stay away is like raising her in a house with a pool, but never showing her how to swim. Eventually, it's going to go horribly wrong. You really need to teach her some Latin and a bit of Kung Fu so that she can scrap it out with Annabelle on her own if you're ever away on the job. Now for Roger. 
We know that the demon wants to possess his wife and kill the children. So for God's sake, man, don't leave her with them at the motel unattended while you run out to the store for some chips and soda. You're practically handing them over to the forces of evil at that point. Be smart and stick together. That way, Bathsheba can't decide to kidnap your daughters for use in her next unholy ritual. The Warrens arrive at the house with Officer Brad, but the front door is locked, so he blows it open with his shotgun, and they hurry inside. Hearing sounds of screaming from the basement, they run downstairs and see the men battling with Carolyn, who's trying to stab one of the girls with a huge pair of scissors. With help from Ed and the officer, they wrestle the weapon away, dragging Carolyn upstairs to bring her to see the priests, while Drew goes to find the other missing girl. They make it as far as the front door, but as soon as they try to take her off of the property, massive wounds start to appear all over Carolyn's body, and they realize that the demon will kill her if they take her out of the house. Suddenly, the demonic force pulls her back, dragging her kicking and screaming right down the basement stairs. Rushing after her, the men try and hold Carolyn down, but she easily overpowers them, slamming her husband to the floor and strangling Ed. Brad grabs her, trying to pull her off, but she bites a chunk of his skin right off of his cheek, and is about to finish the job when Lorraine wraps a sheet over her head and buys up an opportunity to restrain her to a wooden chair. Realizing that the priest will never make it in time, Ed decides to perform the exorcism himself, and Lorraine runs outside to get their Bible. Okay, I thought these people were professionals, so can anyone tell me why they walked into a fight with a demon and left their Bible in the damn car? That's pretty much the one and only thing that they needed to bring. And then there's Officer Brad. I understand that he's the new guy, but man, if you're ever going to make it as a cop, then you have to know when a little bit of excessive force is in order. It's 1971, and unfortunately, tasers wouldn't be invented for another three years. Instead of just running up to get your cheek bit off, what you needed to do was protect and serve that she-devil a knuckle sandwich straight to the mouth. Stun her first, and then try to throw on the cuffs. That way you get to go home with all of your skin still on your face where it belongs. Also, since you know this woman just kidnapped two of her kids with the intention of sacrificing them to the devil, wouldn't this be a crucial time to call for backup while you were on your way over? The other officers wouldn't even need to know about the supernatural elements until they got there. Just tell them that you have a hostage situation at the address and need help right away. Bathsheba might be a fair match even for three grown men, but all it would take was two or three more officers on the scene, and there's no way she'd be able to fist fight everyone. Something tells me that a sheet, a bit of rope, and a wooden chair aren't going to be able to hold a spirit that gets its power from Satan himself for very long. But hey, sometimes I guess you have to work with what you've got. It's time for the final battle, but Bathsheba won't be going down without a fight. With the book in hand, the couple crosses themselves and begins the prayer. They douse the woman with holy water, and her scream shocks Ed so much that he drops the small glass bottle. The entire foundation shakes as tools fall from the shelf and a group of birds surround the house, one flying head first through the window and crashing to the ground in front of them. Ed continues the prayer as the woman struggles to break free, vomiting blood onto the sheet covering her head. He commands the demon to reveal itself, and the sheet rips open, showing that she's become completely possessed by the spirit of the witch Bathsheba. For a moment, everything goes silent, until the woman levitates up to the ceiling still strapped to her chair, before crashing to the floor and shattering it to pieces. Just then, a huge piece of furniture falls right on top of Ed, and he rolls to safety just in time. The demon rises up from the floor, laughing maniacally as Brad's shotgun fires trying to kill Ed. Ed once again. While they're distracted, she grabs the scissors and runs through a hole in the wall into a crawl space under the kitchen where their missing daughter has been hiding the whole time. She grabs the girl and is about to kill her when Ed gets the witch's attention by calling her true name, and Lorraine grabs her head through the hole in the door, demanding that Carolyn fights back against the spirit and remembers the loving times that she's shared with her family. The woman begins to cry as a holy light shines down on her face, letting the girl go and coughing up a bunch of blood as she comes back to her senses. The battle is over, the house is theirs again, and Bathsheba has been sent back to hell. April hands Lorraine her lost locket, and the men share a nod that only true bros who've just vanquished a demon can understand. 
The Warrens arrive back at their house, and Ed places the cursed music box on a shelf in their evidence room. Lorraine says that the priest already wants to meet about another case, and as they lock the door behind them, the music starts to play by itself. It looks like the nightmare isn't over after all. But what would you do? If you just bought a house only to find out that it was haunted, yeah, I can see bringing in the specialists to see if there's actually foul play afoot, but if it doesn't seem like the ghosts are gonna disappear anytime soon, would you stay or would you get the f out? Let us know down in the comments below what you would do. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out that How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. I'll see you guys in the next video and have a damn good day.